what is wonderful and beautiful in my life is my friendship with everyone at the Golden Gate Breakfast Club. For my speaker for the first time, the Golden Gate Breakfast Club was the first group I spoke to outside of the hairstyling industry where I started speaking and I became their first woman member in 2000. Whoa. We have wonderful speakers just as we are hearing today. Do you want to have real impact on your audiences? Whether your audience is one, 10, 100, or 1,000. When you speak, would you like them to lean into your message, connect with you deeply, and take action on their lives to make them better? Then you must find and deliver emotionally powerful stories. And the fastest, most powerful way to do that is to follow the principles that every year Hollywood uses to generate tens of billions of dollars through movies and television. You're about to learn firsthand Michael Haig's unique approach to story. Based on more than 35 years as one of Hollywood's top script consultants and story experts. Worldwide, Michael has enlightened, enlightened, entertained, and transformed more than half a million writers, filmmakers, speakers, entrepreneurs, and business leaders. They, in turn, have influenced tens of millions. Now, don't take my word for it, because ever since October 2002, when he sat in the fourth row of one of my audiences, we have become friends, supporters, and collaborators. However, you can trust actor Will Smith, who said, no one is better than Michael Haig at finding what is most authentic in every moment of a story. To discuss Hollywood storytelling secrets to drive your business and to never look at movies the same way again, please welcome my friend Michael Haig. <clears throat> so it was 13 years ago last February. And I was sitting in my office, which <laughs> I have a green screen that looks exactly like my office behind me. And at that point, it was late in the evening and I was performing one of my primary activities in my career, and that is staring out the window. But at that time, I was feeling kind of sorry for myself. Now, I have a great career. I've had a great career. I love what I do. I basically for almost 40 years have got to spend every single day talking about movies and stories. So I've been very blessed, but I was still a bit pouty that night staring out the window because I was thinking about the inner circle. Now, I know you're all familiar with the inner circle. The inner circle is simply in any enterprise there are always a few people that have reached the pinnacle. They're like the top rung. They're, they're the masters of that group. And everyone else looks up to them. Now, every group has this. There, there would be an inner circle of realtors, an inner circle of plumbers, an inner circle of speakers, an inner circle of attorneys and butchers and bakers and candlestick makers, whatever. So you all know that, but if there is a world capital of the inner circle, it is Hollywood. Hollywood is built on the idea that there's these high rung people. And not only are they at the top, they all seem to hang out with each other. And so I was feeling like, yeah, I've enjoyed my career. You know, at that point it had been for 25 years in Hollywood, I've had a great time, but I never was in that inner circle. I, I always sort of dreamed of being there, if I could just touch that sometime. So as I'm sort of being whiny and self-indulgent, the phone rings. So 
I push the speaker and say, hello, it's Michael Haig. And on the other end, the voice says, hi, my name is Tracy. I work with Will Smith. I take her off speaker. I say, you mean Will Smith, Will Smith? And she said, yeah, that's the one. And she said, Will is working on a movie right now. It's called I Am Legend. They're shooting up in Canada. He wants to know if you'd be willing to look at the screenplay because they're still not happy with a few elements of it. And he would like to get your feedback. So I pause about three seconds for dignity and said, yeah, I think I can find the time. So she emailed me the script. I dove in, I read it, I took notes, read it again, typed up or wrote out my pages and pages of suggestions, emailed it back to Tracy, and that was it. And I said to my wife, Vicki, how cool was that? I mean, the biggest movie star in the world is now looking at my ideas about this movie. So that was neat until about two days later, I get another call We're on speaker. Hi, this is Tracy. If you remember, I work, take her off speaker. Yeah, I remember Tracy, you work with Will Smith. And she said, Will really liked what you had to say in your notes. Would you be willing to have a meeting with him because he has some new ideas of his own and he would like to bounce them off you. So two, three, yeah, I think I can find the time. But I said, before you go, I'd like to know, how does Will Smith even know who I am? Uh, and <clears throat> she said, well, she said, I know he has always, for years, he's had your book, Writing Screenplays That Sell, which at that point had been out for years and was sort of established. But he said, she said, I think the main reason he wanted me to contact you is because he watched a video you did called The Hero's Two Journeys. And what he loved about it is, I know he loved the, the what you talked about, the inner journey of the character and the journey from living in identity to living in their essence. So I think that's why. And I said, cool. So we set the meeting for two days later and I was gonna have my meeting with Will. So I don't know if you're like me, but when I have a big event like that or a big call, I always get there early. So about a half hour before this call, I'm sitting here, which is a terrible idea because all I can do then is just get nervous. But I figured I'm okay because I had the script, I had my notes, I had my Xanax, I thought I'm prepared for this. So finally, Will gets on the phone and he says, hi, hi. And I said, look, uh, it's great to meet you. And I know you want to talk about the movie, but you got to let me do the fan thing first. And he knew what I meant and he said, okay. And I said, I just want to tell you that Hitch is one of my all time favorite movies. In fact, I said, I have lectured about that movie numerous times because I consider it not only a great movie and script, but it's a wonderful example of a brilliant romantic comedy that hit, hits all the basic beats of a good romantic comedy. And he said, well, I should probably tell you that the entire time we were developing the script for Hitch, we kept asking ourselves, now, are we doing what Michael Haig said we should do and talking about the identity and the essence of the characters? And I thought, I'm in the circle. <laughs> it was one of the neatest experiences I ever had because I'd never known of a movie that, that I got to talk about and it succeeded at using my principles because the makers had, had, were familiar with them through something I had said. So it was not only a great moment, it was the beginning of a really cool relationship because I went on retainer sometime after that. And I think maybe four years later, I was up in Park City with Will and his family and the filmmakers developing the script for Karate Kid. So I tell that story because what I, what I wanted you to pick up mostly there is this idea of identity and essence that he responded to. We're gonna to get to that in a few minutes. Right now, what I wanna do is I want to show you how Hollywood principles applied to stories in business or in any enterprise, when you are trying to move people to action or change people's lives or get them as clients or customers, when you can follow the Hollywood principles, those are the things that are going to elevate your storytelling and 
do a much better job of persuading people whatever you're trying to persuade them. And that is because Hollywood understands this principle better than anywhere. And that is the primary goal of any story is to elicit emotion. Because whenever we make decisions about anything, whenever we decide what we want to do, what we want to buy, we always make that decision out of emotion. We may back it up with facts and data and arguments and so on. But if you can tell a story that makes people feel, that is how you're going to connect with them most deeply. Now, some of you know because we put it in the thing, but I decide I'll take two movies, one of which is clearly Hitch, and the other is The King's Speech, and I'm going to show you how they use principles that I'm talking about, that I've been developing through all those years in Hollywood, and I'm going to show you how those principles can be applied to your story just as easily and be just as effective. So what I'm going to offer you is really very simple, not necessarily easy, but simple, and that is the, the six key elements that all well-told stories are gonna have. I don't care if it's a hit movie or a great speech from the stage, a great presentation online, a story in a book you're writing or reading about how to be better at some skill. These are the six things that all great stories have in common. So principle number one is your story must have a hero. Now by hero, I simply mean a protagonist. When you tell a story, you want to have a character that I'm gonna say audience. It's an audience if it's a speech, it's a, it's a reader if it's online or a webinar <clears throat> or, or a book you've written or whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, they're interchangeable, audience reader. So I'll switch back and forth. You wanna have one character that that audience can root for and that will lead us through the journey of the story. Now, when I say hero, I just mean the main character. I'm not talking about someone who is heroic. In fact, most of the time, stories are about people who are not heroic. They're about ordinary people who then, through the course of the story, may become heroic may find their courage and may accomplish whatever they're trying to do. And it's important principle to keep in mind because when I, when I present to people or I work with my clients, one of the frequent obstacles they face, one of the frequent excuses I hear for not using stories in their presentation is the belief, why would anybody want to hear about me? I'm nobody special. I've never climbed Everest. I haven't overcome a mammoth obstacle or medical condition or poverty or whatever. I'm just ordinary. So they'd find my stories boring. And I would argue, no, not only is that not true, but actually you're at an advantage by being an ordinary person because those are the characters that your audience, who is made up in one in some ways entirely of ordinary people because we all have a we all are ordinary we all see ourselves that way <clears throat> even people at the even in the inner inner circle we all have a touch of the imposter syndromes we all see ourselves as ordinary and if you take movies that are successful take the king's speech you may say i you know now that's certainly about a hero but at the beginning of the story he's not he's second in line to be king, which he doesn't want to do at all. He's, he's cursed with this horrible speech impediment. We learn in the course of the thing, he's just a guy who has a wife, a couple of kids. He had a terrible childhood and he's just trying to get by and then he will become heroic. And the same in Hitch. Now Hitch has a very, uh, uh, one great skill set. He knows how to match people up, but that doesn't make him heroic. That just means he's good at that. But otherwise, he's just a guy who is scared of dating or scared of getting involved, et cetera, et cetera. So you have to create this hero who is an everyday person who has the potential to become heroic. That's number one. Principle number two, 
you must create empathy with that character. All empathy means is, it, empathy really means I feel what you feel. You wanna create a, a, a strong psychological or subconscious connection between your audience or your reader and the hero of your story. Now, it doesn't matter if your hero is you, if you're telling a story about some success you've had or something that happened to you, or as you were doing, those of you who did it, um, and, and thank you to those who, who tried out. I, no, I, I noticed uh, Tony, Betty, Anne, and Craig, especially, and, and Patricia, of course, all use that sort of exercise. But it was just to give you a very short version of, this is an autobiographical story where you talk about someone who else, who you helped, and they become the hero of that story, or you're the hero if you talk about how you accomplish something, okay? Whatever it is, you've got to create empathy with that character. Because when we hear stories, when we watch movies, movies are emotional because we become that character on a psychological level. We're the ones who are desperate to make a good speech. We're the ones who are terrified of commitment but are falling in love with the other person. Or we're the ones who are, who, uh, who, the hero who hitches, I'm thinking of Albert, we're the ones who, who Hitch is trying to, we are like Hitch who is trying to help another character find true love himself. Now, the way you create that empathy, there are really three key ways. One is you get us to feel sorry for your character. You make the hero of your story some victim, a victim of some undeserved misfortune. So why of all the places in his life does the King's speech open with that speech at Wembley Stadium? Because it is so, it's beyond sympathetic. It's just mortifying to have to watch him struggle just to get the words out. And we see everybody is so embarrassed for him. And as soon as we feel that, we are completely connected with that character. We become that character because we feel so sorry for him. The second way is you can put the character in jeopardy. By jeopardy, I simply mean the character is in danger of losing something of vital importance. Now, if you're writing a thriller, the jeopardy for the hero is usually a serial killer or, or aliens or, or you know, terrorists or whatever it might be. I'm assuming most of your autobiographical stories, not all. <laughs> now, if you're, if you're a handwriting expert who's gonna catch a serial killer, that could be it. But most of the time, we're not in that kind of danger, but we oftentimes are worried about or in danger of losing our, more, losing our home, losing our job, in danger of living an ordinary life when we wanna do something extraordinary. So if you create that jeopardy when you introduce your hero, that will create empathy. And the third way is you make the character likable because not only do we identify and empathize with people we like, but if you're telling a story for business in your attempt to get clients, we like to work with people we like. And, uh, and I bet anything, all of you have had the experience of choosing to work with somebody because their credentials were great. And when you meet them, it's like, yeah, I don't know, I, you know, not somebody I really care about, but I'm sure they're good at what they do. And how often does that work out for you? That's a, it's a disaster because we want to connect with people we like. So, and the way you make somebody likable is simply show them as generous and kind to other people. So number two, create empathy with that hero. Third key element of a great story is <clears throat> the hero must have a goal. The hero must want something. And the more specific that goal is, the more we can envision it when we hear what it is, the stronger the story will be. So if you say, I work with, or if you're telling an autobiographical story and you say, at this time in my life, I wanted to be successful. Okay, well, that's a goal, but I have no idea what that looks like. I don't know what that means. I mean. I, I could maybe say what it means for me. I have no idea what the character means by success. So let's say you narrow it down. Now, 
I wanted to be rich. Well, better, but it's still, I don't know what that looks like. I can't, in, when you say rich, I can't get a picture. And as a storyteller, you're like a screenwriter. You want to create a, a movie inside the mind of your reader. We need to picture it. But if you say, I wanted to make $30,000 so I could get my child into college, pay for their education. Now it's a finish line I can recognize. I know what a $30,000 balance in your bank account would look like. Or I know what it would look like to take a child off to their first day of college because you made that money. So you have to have a character who wants something it's, it's what I call when I talk about movies that outer motivation because it's outwardly visible. And here's the test. Say to a friend or any, any associate, okay, my hero wants this. What would that look like? And then go to somebody else who wasn't in that conversation to ask the same question. And if both people, you ask that question of picture the same thing, now you've got a good finish line for your story. So in Hitch, it's not just he wants love and he wants success. He wants to get Albert Brenneman to, to win the love of Allegra Cole. And there's two goals because it's a romantic comedy and he wants to win the love of Sarah Milas. And, and we can picture what it looks like for two people to be in love because it means, or win the love, because it means they're gonna ride off into the sunset happily ever after, or it's gonna end like it does in Hitch with their marriage, with their wedding. In King's Speech, and this is one of the brilliant things about that movie, it's the King's Speech is not a biography. We learn a lot about Albert and how he became King George, but it doesn't start as a child and take us all the way through his life. It's about a moment in his life it's, it was about a three or four year, maybe longer moment, but it's presented as a, a, a segment of his life where his goal was simply, I want to give a speech without stuttering. And now we can picture, okay, if he could just, it's the opposite of what happens at the beginning. If he could just give a speech. Now it turns out that that speech is one of the most important, most famous speeches of the 20th century, where he had to lead his country into World War II. But now we can envision this is what he wants. So those two goals or those three goals in those two movies are very specific. Next principle, number four, your story must have conflict. If you remember, the number one goal of any story is to elicit emotion. Emotion grows out of conflict, not desire, okay? Desire drives the story, but it doesn't create emotion unless there are obstacles for your hero to overcome. And the bigger the obstacle, the greater the conflict. The greater the conflict, the more the emotion will be. And you want those obstacles to build through the course of the story. So in the King's speech, <laughs> The conflict, first and foremost, is he has this speech impediment that he's got to overcome. The next, but there's a whole conflict with Lyle Logue, someone he has no interest in working with because he doesn't, isn't willing to, you know, honor all the trappings of royalty, it makes him come to him, and he wants to call him Albert, and, and uh, so on. So, so those are obstacles, and then there's the obstacles of all of... Uh, you know, the, the palace and all of his, you know, advisors and, and the Archbishop of Canterbury and all the people who are trying to push him into these other ineffective coaches and saying, you should get rid of this line of Logue. And then, of course, there's this slight conflict of a brother who abdicates and World War II begins. So those obstacles that build, that creates more and more emotion. And I think I skipped something there when I talked about how we empathize with him and I was talking about ordinary people. Yeah, I did. We, we empathize with him, not because he's a prince or a king and not because he lives, you know, he's long dead, 
It's because we all have had situations where we feel we're incapable of doing what we want to do. It's the emotional qualities of the hero that we empathize with. And, and I'm backtracking, but I want to make this point. Empathy has nothing to do with physical situation. If you're telling a good story, it doesn't matter what that character, how old they are, what they do for a living or any of that. It just matters that we can connect with the emotional conflict that they're in. Okay, coming back, you've got to create obstacles. You've got to create conflict for the character. The fifth thing is the, the story must have a resolution. It's got to have a climax. And you have to let us see in our mind, we have to experience the hero's moment of victory. We have, I mean, imagine the King's speech, if you went through and then somebody, but we never saw the speech. And, and it, when he's working with Lyle Logan, it, it jumps to the, the, the palace coming in saying, well, your highness, that was a great speech. <laughs> that, would not, that would not have won the best picture Oscar if we didn't get to see the speech or, or best actor for that matter, or, wouldn't have, or it wouldn't have made more than hundred million dollars. We have to see Albert Brenneman and, and um, uh, his true love get together. We have to see Hitch and Sarah Milas finally declare I love you to each other. And, we, and so in your story, it may sound silly, but I've heard many stories where somebody says, I worked with a client and they really wanted this. And now that client is a multimillionaire. And it's like, but wait, what happened in the speech? What happened at that moment? So you need to give that resolution. And finally, the last element and in some ways the most important, although it won't work unless you have the other five, and that is you have to have transformation. In fact, you have to have several layers of transformation. For what that just means is things are different at the end of the story than they were at the beginning. First of all, the character's situation, the hero's physical situation must change because they were going after a goal. So either they won or they lost. But we see in this, what I call the aftermath scene, we see the new life that that character is now gonna live. After, after Hitch and Sarah Milis declare their love, now we see them at, in the aftermath at uh, Albert and uh, Allegra's wedding. And we see now the new life he's gonna live where he has learned things and, and where he's still gonna help people get together, but he's not gonna be hiding behind that job. So you want physical transformation for the character. Next, the world around the character has to have changed. In other words, that character, a hero in a good story is always going to have an effect on other people. And in, mo in stories that have a successful ending, a happy ending, it almost always means life is better for the, for the people who surround the character. It might just be their family, might be a group of friends, it might be an institution, it could be the whole world, depending on who the story is about. But if you really want to reach the deepest level of emotional connection, you want to take your hero on an inner journey. That's where that identity and essence that Will responded to in the lecture he heard me give before he called me. He was tapping into that. It's the idea that the character on the inside is gonna transform. And that for transformation is always an arc. The arc of the story is always the hero going from living in fear to living courageously. We all, present to the world an identity, a false self, a persona, if you follow Jungian psychology, because we want to protect ourselves from whatever fear we have based on wounds that occurred long before. So we're all afraid of something. And in a good story, the character is being held back, not just by the external circumstances, but in the King's speech, 
he is terrified because of his abusive childhood and his position in his family. He believes I am not qualified to be king. And it, gave, it, it instilled in him the this, this speech impediment and it's, it's the reason that he, ha, that he has that and it's the thing he must confront because now his brother abdicates and he has to be king. And by the end, he has not only made the good speech, he has found the courage to stand in his new role of king. When Lionel Logue at the end says to him, you're the, you're the bravest man I've ever known and convinces him, you have a voice. All of that is conveying the transformation he goes through. And in Hitch, he's in, in Albert's words, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't buy what he's selling. He says, you don't know anything about love at all. And Hitch says to him, no, love is my life. And Albert says to him, no, love is your job. But he's not willing to commit. And in the setup, when we first meet Hitch, we see immediately that fear because he's playing pool with his friend and he has no interest in a committed relationship or so on. He's just about picking women up and sleeping around and helping other people get together. And he has to become courageous enough and vulnerable enough that he will finally commit and own his, his vulnerability and his love for Sarah Milis in the end. So when you're telling a business story, whether it's about yourself or someone else, what you want, if to, you don't, this is not a must. I mean, you can tell a, a fascinating story. You, there are movies that don't have an arc. Indiana Jones movies, he doesn't really change and they're great movies. But if you wanna to go to a deeper level of connection, you will explore the hero's fear. You'll be willing to reveal your own vulnerability when you talk about yourself. You're, will, you're willing to go deeper into the vulnerability of the people you have helped because that's where you're gonna get the greatest connection and empathy from your audience and your reader because those are the things we all feel. And if you are trying to persuade a specific group, let's say, Patricia, let's say you are giving, telling a story and your audience are people who want to be better speakers. When you tell stories that tap into the fears, the false beliefs, the identities that the, that group has, and you talk about a hero who has that fear, then because they are identifying with the hero of your story, they have the emotional experience of finding the courage that character did. And when you know your audience well enough, you know your re reader well enough to know what the obstacles are, and you can tell stories about characters who had those same fears and overcame them, that's where, you've, that's where you reach your greatest power of persuasion. And that is where you give the message of the story. Because in the aftermath, when the, when the transformation has taken place and you paint a picture of the new life the character is able to live because they found that courage, whatever it is that you want your audience to believe or whatever action or if you want them to take whatever courage they need, whatever your message is, your hero must learn the same message. If you were giving an inspirational speech on the need to stand up for yourself, then you need to tell stories about characters who are hiding and finally learn to stand up for themselves. Because whatever you want your audience to learn, that's what your hero needs to learn through the course of the story. And last of all, I said there were multi-levels to the transformation. If you are willing to tell stories where you go that deep into your own vulnerability, your own fear, your own obstacles, your own misgivings, or how you have, or what you felt when you at the start of those stories, when you can make yourself that vulnerable and transparent, 
then you yourself will have a transformation. You'll not only transfer your, uh, transform your audience, but when you go that deep, that's where you will transform. That's where you will be a better storyteller, but more important, that's where you will find the greatest impact on your audiences and your readers. That's how you change people's lives or story. Okay. I, eight, eight, eight third. Well, thank you, thank you. Everybody's muted, but I see so much silent clapping. I'm gonna, I'm gonna assume that's it. Um, so I, 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 if I think we have some time, if anybody has Craig, if, are we? Can we open it for for questions, or what do we do now? Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. And, and if I may jump in, we've had a lot more guests that weren't acknowledged. One of the most famous in-demand futurists, Dan Burris, joined us. He has to race off and give his own speech. Linda Shively, Susan Rowan, some of our own guests, Frank Reed, Mike Milstein, and Tricia Mangabot have joined us and weren't acknowledged. But Michael, that was fabulous. Thank really you. wonderful, and I'm sure friends are going to ask you questions, but as I invited you, I'm asking the first. And really, it was, you told us the Will Smith story to mm -hmm. Darren and me over dinner, and we you'd never said it in a speech. And we said, you must add the Will Smith story to your speech. Tell us be vulnerable why didn't you do it until we forced you to <laughs> yeah i i get the feeling that the, the the breakfast club knows you and you've all been subjected to, <laughs> to patricia saying you must do this and you want to do that you know we have a lot of guests that said i came because patricia show told me i should when you said that darren and patricia after they had they had seen a, a, a presentation I made, I was part of a conference. They spent a whole afternoon listening to me talk, and they took me out to dinner because Patricia and I were friends. And I swear their butts hadn't hit the seat before the first thing they said was, "You got to tell that Will Smith story." And I said, "No, I do not, <laughs> and I'm not going to, because it's just bragging." And so my fear was you know, full force, because I thought, no, I can't do that. It'll seem like I'm full of myself. And my mother taught me not to be too big for my britches and so on. And Patricia and Darren pointed out that I, I could let you say this, but I want you to know I learned this, that the value of the story is not to make me look good. It's to number one, verify that the principles that I'm telling my audience then were ones that really work and really contributed to the movie Hitch. And the other reason, and, and I, I should add, the next time I was forced to tell it was with Patricia, because she invited me to be a guest when she was at the NSA chapter in Los Angeles. And I just said, you want to have lunch? And she said, why don't you come join me in the talk? And she made me tell it there. And then she did a poll and said to everybody, how many of you thought Michael was bragging and no hands were up? How many thought he should tell that speech? And they did, so since then I will. The other reason now I tell it is because I want, I, I feel it's good to start with a story, but if you were to look back, you'll see all those elements were there. You know, the setup, I got you to feel sorry for me a bit. It was a bit self-deprecating. I had a goal, I got I gotta help Will with this script and so on and so on. So it was, it was one of the, it was the single most valuable lesson of many that you have taught me, Patricia. That just turned things around. Before I, before I ask for other questions, I should say too, I have, I have like a gift because uh, my process that I just took you through, what I consider the six steps success story process I have a, a chart that lays it all out and that explains each of the steps of the chart. And if you'd like that for free, I'll give you, let's see, maybe Craig, you could put this in the chat. I don't want to try and type while I'm talking because I'm terrible at tech, but sure. if you could go to storymastery.com. Okay, hold on a second, storymaster.com. No, no, storymastery with a Y at the end. Okay. Storymastery.com slash 
Uh -huh. uh, success. Just the word success. Storymastery.com is my website and it's there's an abundance of information and articles and things that I've shared about storytelling. But if you put the slash success, then we will send you, you know, we'll send you a link to have your own chart of those six steps. So I didn't want to forget to do that. And I also don't want to forget, I want to make a shout out to, um, oh, uh, let's see, Anastasia. Because I think Anastasia, you're a guest, but she's in Corvallis, Oregon. And I was born and raised in Salem. And I was an Oregon duck in Eugene, which means we're competitors because she might be a Beaver fan. But I just, I like to acknowledge anyone who's in Oregon because I still consider myself an Oregonian. So good for you, Anastasia. Okay. Any, um, any you just, I'll answer questions until somebody says, okay, it's time for you to shut up, Michael. So. Any questions in the chat or or any questions? Well, well, first of all, I see Bill Buchanan's hands raised. So why don't we, you know, bring it over to Bill? And uh, before that, I just, uh, Michael, thank you for your presentation. You know, you're you yourself are like a Hemingway hero. So <laughs> okay, I, now is that because of my great skill or just because I've got the white beard? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a that's a different layer we'll have to go over. <laughs> yeah. no, I, don't, I don't want to follow everything there is to. I don't want to go down the path he went down. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, Bill, Bill Buchanan. Uh, good morning, Michael. Uh, thanks very much for a very crisp uh, presentation, very useful. <clears throat> and uh, you're talking about Will Smith, <clears throat> and the image came to mind. <clears throat> of uh, one of the scenes in Independence Day where uh, Will Smith is a, uh, a Marine Corps fighter pilot who just shot down some kind of alien mm -hmm. and he's uh, leaving the smoking wreckage and dragging this big ugly reptile across the Mojave Desert. <laughs> I said, that's it. So anyway, I'm putting a hitch in my Netflix queue. I'll get back to Will Smith thanks to you. Uh, a question for you uh, about the, the process. I'm I'm a private investigator, I have another business too. And so, you know, I'm interested in small business uh, operations. And I'm just wondering um, if you're brought aboard as a consultant on a screenplay, and let's say they're halfway through and they say, oh man, you know, this is this, we're going off the rails here, let's call Michael. And you look at it and after a couple of days, you get back to the client, you say, you know, this is uh, just a smoking pile of garbage. <laughs> Uh, what, 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 how do you handle that? Do they, do they go back to the beginning or how do you handle that? Do you, do you come aboard and try to put all the nuts and bolts together and make it successful? Is that what you do? Yeah, well, as, a, as any one of you are coaches, I would strongly recommend you not have your opening words in a coaching session. What you have here is a smoking pile of garbage. <laughs> I try and be a bit more positive than that. But I will tell you the uh, the. I would never say that what I do in every coaching session, it doesn't matter if they've got, well, every story can be improved. What I say to screenwriters is, okay, this isn't, you know, I'm not going to tell you to throw it in the garbage and I'm not going to option this. So we're somewhere in between. <laughs> and so I always begin by asking questions and more questions and more questions. And I would say this to all of your coaches, because in that case, and it's the same when I work with clients, who are in business, whether it's internet marketers or sales execs or, or entrepreneurs or public speakers. I never start by saying, do this, or mm -hmm. this works, or this doesn't. I always need to find out, what do you want to do with this story? When, when I worked on Karate Kid and we went up to Park City to spend three days just, just deep diving into the script, me and the director and the screenwriter, the producer and Will, then the first day, Will said, we got to figure out what is this story about? And we spent an entire day before we ever started talking about scenes or dialogue. What is this sto story about? Meaning, what do we want to say with this story? And so I'm always trying to get what, what do you want this to be? Why do you think this is a movie? Why do you want to tell this story from the stage? What are you trying to say? Or I'll ask, where are you in this story? How is this reflective of you? Or I'll ask, 
as we get into it, one of my favorite questions, because it has to do with transformation, what terrifies your hero? Because if you can figure out what your hero, and if it's you, what you were experiencing, if you can figure out the level of fear or what the deepest fear of a character is, and then we go from there. It's a, um, and, then, and then you fill up their senses, <laughs> just like whoever, whoever gave us that musical interlude, it's fine, you know? That's what you need to do as a storyteller. Fill up the senses of your audience. That was put, that was pretty good for an ad lib, I think. Okay, I hope that answered that question. Any yes, others? Michael, I have a question. This is Rick Wilson. Um, it, it occurs to me when you're first talking to Will Smith and he's seeking your advice, there's two hurdles you have to get over. The first one is to get his attention and get him to believe that he needs you. And then the, the second one is, You've got to get into how much this is going to cost you, Will, for me to help you out. And so how much do you give away before you get to the part where you say, if you want me to help you, it's going to cost this and this and this? Okay. Well, to talk about Will per specifically, neither of those were hurdles for me because Will called me. I did. I did. I, I, I would like to claim that I am this great self-marketer and so on. I can't, it, it would be a lie. All the good things that have happened to me, meeting Patricia was this way, you know, meeting Will have happened because I put information out there or I, it was out there available and then people saw it and came to me. My clients come to me because, and so he had already, he already convinced himself I'd be helpful because he gave, saw the lecture I gave. As far as money, uh, well, with Will, I wouldn't have even brought it up because that I just have a fee, and I figure, you know, he's he's he can he he's got a dollar or two. I didn't think that would be an issue. With other people, either they know know my rates because they go to my website and it says what the packages are, or if we're having a pre-discussion, and I had a client recently and wanted something very specific because she's writing a certain kind of nonfiction book to promote herself. And so we figured out what I would do and then I just quoted a price. So in the moment of coaching, those things aren't usually issues. And as far as how much do I give away for free? I, the, the thing is, I, I, my belief is pretty much give it all because it, it, if, if I have a book that is filled with information people need, they'll, I'll sell the book. And I, I have three books, which you don't get money off books, but as a presenter or a consultant, you know, I figure people are not coming with, like I just told you every, I wasn't holding anything back in this half hour. Those are the six things that are essential. I figure if you like that and you're trying to create a story of yourself and you say, yeah, now I know what to do, but I really could use some guidance you'll get in touch and then you'll want my help to go. It's like the difference between I give you a map of how to get from A to B versus I take you by the hand and lead you from A to B. So the idea of having ideas that I hold back and don't give away, I don't really operate that way. I just think, put it out there and I want people to tell better stories and then I, I will get returns on that. So that'll be fine. Thank you, Michael. Michael. Your book is behind you on your shelf. Why don't you bring it forward well, and people like can get it? Yeah. Because this is a great book and it's about how business people use these principles. So it is this is not the book designed for screenwriters or romance writers. This is for business people. It mm -hmm. is wonderful. And I bet at storymastery.com we could order it, Michael. Yes, absolutely. Yes, good. Michael, I have a question for you. This is Ann Mahoney. You probably don't remember me, but we met in LA years ago and you helped me work on a screenplay, if you believe it or not. Yeah. And I've had, I've had your book forever. It's pretty dog-eared. But um, I want to talk about transformation mm -hmm. because when you said, you know, I just wanted to play in the big leagues and be with the big boys. And then it happened. Do you feel that it has changed 
how you feel about yourself and how you approach your work and how you approach your work with other people in a sense of maybe you knew you always belonged on, on the front lines on the A team, but now you are. I'm, I'm just wondering when you went through that transformation, how it affects your life now or your work now, if it does. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for saying that and great to see you again. Um, here's the thing, uh, my honest belief is, it's like when I got into the inner circle with Will, it was like going to a wedding and it was, it was Will plus one. In other words, I got to, you don't stay there. I'm not in the inner circle constantly. He is, he's managed to be the top movie star in the world for now more than 20 years. But for me, it's a moment to feel like I was getting to be at that level. So I, I don't look at it. And I don't know if anybody who's in the inner circle sees it as I'm, you know, it, it's, it's uh, not like being a teacher who gets to, to work forever. I felt like I was in there for a moment. So I would say to answer your question, forgetting the inner circle part, but as, uh, as I've done this more and more, what I feel like I've changed is I have been, a, I've, I've got much more self-confidence, if that's the word. I, I trust more and more that I'm good at this. And then, and so I don't get anxious I'd still, I'm still anxious if Will calls, but you know, I, it's, it's this, this hard to accept, and I assume I'm not alone in this, hard to accept, yeah, I'm really good at this one thing. I, 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 I'm, <laughs> I'm not very good at anything else. I, I'm sort of a one trick pony, but when it comes to story, having gotten to work with him, that's not so much just that one call, having gotten to work with Morgan Freeman and other top people in Hollywood and having to now work with a number of people in areas of business and helping them make sometimes millions of dollars, at least I once I, mute. I don't feel anxious about it. theory that. mute. I'm sorry. I lost, I lost the question and froze, I guess. No, did I freeze? Oh, no. maybe no. I did I? No, I didn't freeze, but okay. um, well, but you know, I, I don't want you to, it sounds like you feel like you touched the hem of the king and you're now you're still waiting for to be called back when I, I well, I never saw you that way anyway, but I, I just would think it, you would approach your work on a different level at some point, you know, once you've, yeah. Not that you need the recognition. I don't mean that. But I just when you say transformation, did you ever feel a transformation in yourself? Gradually. I, yeah. I mean, I don't the thing is I don't want to, I don't want to, I'm not trying to be self-deprecating. It's just the way it is, is more and more I I don't feel like I'm I don't suffer from the imposter syndrome, if you will, when it comes to guiding people on stories. Got it. You know, the content. Uh, so in that regard, being in the inner circle is really other people's perception. So if I don't see myself that way, I don't. But maybe it is. Maybe my mother didn't teach me, don't be too big for your britches. But I know I'm good at this one thing. And that makes a difference because here's one way. When I'm working with somebody on a story, there are times when you're trying to write a story or write a speech and so on that you just feel that I just encountered a problem with the story I can't possibly overcome. And I can honestly and confidently say, no, we'll figure it out. You can overcome because I've just had so much experience overcoming problems. Did that, I hope that answered. I don't want to no, just- No, that's perfect. That's perfect. Crazy, thank you for saying that and thank you. And, and you can, if you want to keep thinking of me in the inner circle, that's cool. I'm happy with that. <laughs> Michael, you're, you're, you're here at the Breakfast Club, so you have arrived. You have arrived. <laughs> that's true. Um, uh, Nancy Gary had a, a question. So Nancy, would you like to answer? Go ahead. Yes, thank you so much. This has been a wonderful program this morning. I have an idea for a story that I've been carrying around for a very long time. And I'm wondering uh, the best way to come at it because I think it has the potential to be a novel. It also has the potential to be 
a screenplay. So when you're kind of looking at it from these two different perspectives, what's a good way to start working through the content? Well, it depends. The ideas. I'll try and make this brief, and it sounds like something that we should have a real conversation about. So if you I think we will. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> Because you know this would be it'd be good to spend an hour and I could help you with that. But on the, the, the because I get a question like that is I have to ask questions back. And the first one is, well, first is have you written before? Have you written ever written scripts or 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 novels before? Or is this a first time thing? This would be the first time thing. I've I've done a lot of business writing and some comedy writing, but okay. not this so. Type of thing. So here's here's step one. Okay, uh, first of all, lay out what the story is. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, for you, I recommend get my book called Writing Screenplays That Sell. I said it down, I, I held it up once before, just because you're going a different path. And this tells you A to Z. But work out the story and don't think about novel or script right away. And then when you've got it done, write the opening 15 pages of the script and write the opening 15 pages of the book. And the question to ask is, which one, which was more fun? <laughs> Don't say which is better. Just say which is more fun. Okay. Now, if if I if I were coaching you, I'd want to hear the story, and because there are some stories that just Hollywood would not be interested in, and there are some stories that are just made to be written as novels. And you also need to be aware that the percentage of scripts that get produced is very, very small. The percentage of novels that get published uh, could be 100% of people who just want to put it out there on their own and self-publish. But those are details. But start by trying both and see which, which do you enjoy and do that. All right. Believer in whatever you do, it should be fun. Not every moment of writing <laughs> is fun, I bet. I, I yeah. know all of you. I, I get the sense that all of you, both retired and still working, seem to really love what you do. It doesn't mean every day you got a smile on your face, but overall you get you get good feeling. So hope that helps and get in touch and we can go deeper about that. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Susan Rowan, best selling author for Michael. Susan, you're muted. Michael, I feel like I've known you for years based on Patricia talking about you. Oh, I know. I personally, I love the fact that what you said, I mean, like six pages of notes in the notebook, oh, that nice. there, there was no need to do fancy schmancy screen things because the content was so brilliant. Um, the other thing that you said that I, it, that really struck me is about kindness and generosity which is I hear you talk about how you work with people, that's who you are. So what you're saying about your heroes is really also, um, is also you. Oh, and you. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna share a quick thing um, of my favorite career changer, Golda Meir, who uh, had a, a general on her cabinet that um, she thought was kind of braggadocious. And one day she said to him, don't be humble, you're not that great. But the truth is, you are that great. And being humble, I think, is something you're just down to earth. And I think that was what resonates with all of us. And I bet it does with your clients and Will Smith. Thank you. That's very nice. Thank you, Susan. That's great to say. And thanks, Patricia, for, for telling her all those things that, that made her wanted to come today. So I appreciate that. And I see by the chat that Janice Litvin, who has been in for a long time as a Frippet friend, is now a member. And she has a question, but I'd like to acknowledge we have another celebrity speaker who joined us, uh, Derek Arden, who is speaking for us again uh, later in November. Uh, so Janice, I, I don't wish to be taking charge, Mr. President, but I just happen to see you, Janice. Come on. No, 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 no. That's okay. fine. I think uh, let's do Janice and then we have Anastasia Lipsky has asked to ask something. And then I think our time's going to be up at that point. Um, Michael, thank you for, you know, sticking around and answering the questions. Sure. 
so generous with your time. I, as you can see, I, you know, I, I, I love this. This is, this is my, this is fun. This is what I consider fun. So, cool. Janice. Okay, Janice. Thank you. So, Michael, I had the pleasure of hearing you present to NSA and C a few years ago, I can't remember, but it was back when I had just begun to come back to NSA. And I don't feel that I had as sophisticated a brain back then. And so I needed to hear your lessons again. And I did know what Susan said that we've heard Patricia talk about you every time we hear her, but to hear you, the master, present to us and make it so clear what the hero's looking for, how we get them there, and then how we pull the emotion out of the audience without saying, oh, I felt so emotional. That's really, really very, very helpful. Mm -hmm. And I just wanna do a quick plug. As you all know, my book uh, is now live on Amazon and to get bestseller status, I'm giving the book away on November 6th, 7th and 8th. I will remind you guys again next week, but, um, Anyway, thank you for the support, everybody. Congratulations. Thank That's you, cool. thank you. And I, and what I tried to do, the whole book is about transformation. And what I tried to do is pluck little vignettes, giving for every example in every chapter in the book, little vignettes of how people were suffering and then how through the book, they came to their transformation. So thank you for that. Yeah. Let, me say, let me say in response to Janice, I'm glad you said that because I was talking about two feature films and giving this, but stories, that's why I suggested the exercise at the beginning. You got one sentence. You were telling stories. You had a, in that, in that sentence, you had a hero. The hero came to you because they had a goal. You helped them with that. They had obstacles to overcome and the climax was whatever you said at the end. And, and the aftermath is, or the, the resolution and, and the transformations revealed at the end. So don't think that these six elements only apply if you're writing a novel or a script or a long speech. You can, testimonials that follow these six, six beats are much more effective testimonials for you too. Mm -hmm. so, thanks, Janice. Thank you. All right, uh, we have a question from Anastasia and that's gonna be our last question for today. I, I'm turning this into the Golden Gate Brunch Club, aren't I? <laughs> I just, if I stay long enough, we'll, we'll, we'll get out the donuts and the croissants and keep going. Thank Mr. you, thank you. And, and, and nice to meet you, a fellow Oregonian. This is still oh. new for me, one and a half years in Corvallis, but loving it. So I'm just curious about your past, like, what brought you to this? Did you grow up thinking you wanted to do this for a living? Were you acting in high school? Like, just, I would love to know what kind of brought you to this. This is not your everyday type of work. Yeah. Um, I, it was, well, speaking of fear, I've, I've loved movies since I was, since I saw my, I think the first movie I remember seeing is The Robe, which shows how old I might be. My dad had a candy store and he popped the popcorn for the movie theater oh. and I got to carry the popcorn in so I'd get free. And I've loved movies. And as I started thinking, what would you like to do? I, I don't know when I first had the thought, I want to be in the movies. It was more, I want to be inside the movie. That seemed like a great world there, not I wanted to be an actor. But I never told anyone because, A, that seemed like a pipe dream and nobody does that. And I didn't want to share it because I didn't want to, to have to commit to it. And so I took another path. I, I, went in, I got a degree in education. I taught Head Start for three years. Mm -hmm. And finally, I reached a tipping point where I thought, look, if I'm ever going to do this, I should do it. So I just sort of went to Hollywood on the turnip truck, fell off knowing nothing, luckily got into a film school where I learned how to read scripts and do synopses and got my first job as a, with an agent getting $10 a script. And it took about a day to write, you know, to write coverage on a script. My dad was so proud. He's making $10 a day, my son. <laughs> in Hollywood. But that started it and everything else just sort of flowed. So wow. it was, it was a secret desire until I finally just, you know, worked up the courage, I, if that's it, to, to trundle down there and get started. 
So awesome. Thank you. Listening. I love the popcorn connection and and your father having a movie theater. Yeah. I mean, that's I'll, that I'll just share this with you. My grand my grandmother founded that store. It was a caramel corn shop. And the first place it was was Corvallis, Oregon. That's where I did oh, it. Right on, oh, right on. Right on. Us Oregonians, we stick together. Oh, yes. Thank and you. we have the, the, the Dark Side Theater here is my favorite thing that shut down and they're just letting people in. And I'm actually going to rent like a theater room just for family, just for fun, just for the kids. We're just going to do a private yeah. showing because we can. Good. <laughs> you know? Good. If one of the silver linings in COVID. Thank you. Thank you. This has been such a pleasure Patricia, and I look I forward to getting your book. Wants to, Patricia's waving her hand. It's probably not going too long. Go ahead, Patricia. Mr. President, we have never had so many people still in at nine o'clock. Could you make me the host? I know this isn't my account, but oh, if you could make me the host, you can leave the meeting and... I know there is one story I would love Michael to tell the pitch freak because it is in the world that he lives in and perhaps some of the other speakers would love to uh, ask a couple of questions still. Oh, well, you know, that's fine. I, I don't have to leave. Uh, but okay, I, fine. You know, so we're, we're fine on the time. You know, if, you know it's 9.03 9 now. So if those of you that do have other obligations you need to move on to, don't worry about it. Um, we wanted to thank everybody for showing up and just, you know, this is, Patricia's right. I mean, we don't, Michael, you, you're a, you're like a Hollywood star in yourself. Everyone's fascinated. So why don't, let's just take a moment and just everyone applaud uh, Michael for his presentation today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Huzzah. Huzzah. Uh, Let me now thank all of you for being here. I really appreciate the turnout and Craig and the group too, for having me. This is just fun. Absolutely. I really appreciate it. So um, why don't we go ahead and, uh, you know, we'll continue on the, the, the Q&A. That's fine. Um, uh, Patricia, do you think I should keep the video running at this point or go ahead and close it out? I would yeah. close the recording. Okay, I'm going to do that oh, right now. Okay. All right, again, thank you, Michael. Okay. It's been a pleasure having you speak today. Okay, now I can tell the truth about it. <laughs>